first reading of, from the first book of Kings, beginning at chapter verse 17. The son of the mistress of the house of Zedipath became ill. His illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. She then said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. But he said to her, Give me your son. He took him from her bosom, carried him up into the upper chamber where he was lodging, and laid him on his own bed. He cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I am staying by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times, and cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. The Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. The life of the child came into him again, and he received, and he revived. Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper chamber into the house, and gave him to his mother. Then Elijah said, See, your son is alive. So the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in reciting Psalm 30, found in your insert, repeating the refrain both before and after. You have restored my life, O Lord. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies triumph over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you, and you restored me to hell. You brought me up, O Lord, from the dead. The second reading is from a letter of Paul to the Galatians. <coughs> I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it. But I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. You have heard, no doubt, of my earlier life in Judaism. I was violently persecuting the church of God and was trying to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism because many among my people of the same age, for I was far more zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. But when God, who had set me apart before I was born and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles, I did not confer with any human beings nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me, but I went away at once into Arabia. And afterwards I returned to Damascus. And after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and stay with him 15 days. But I did not see any other apostle except James, the Lord's brother. And what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the region of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard it said, the one who formerly was persecuting us is now proclaiming the faith 
he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Soon after the healing of the centurion slave, Jesus went to a city called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. She was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her. And he said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the wire. And the bearers stood still. And Jesus said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them. And they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us. And God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Psalm 30. Weeping may spend the night, but joy comes in the morning. What a powerful story that we have in all of the lessons for today. When we go back and, and look at 1 Kings, what we see here is Elijah, called man of God. You have come to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause death of my son, she says to Elijah. Give me your son. And he took her from her and went into the 
the upper chamber of where he was staying and laid the child upon a bed and three times over him cries out to God for the health and life of this person. And lo and behold, because of Elijah's prayers, the child is healed. Weeping may spend the night, but joy comes in the morning. In Galatians, Paul is speaking, and he's talking about what he has done to before God. When he speaks in Galatians and to that church, what has happened in that church is that others came in after Paul, and they had a different gospel from the one in which he was given. Paul is saying to them, remember this, I have no gospel but the gospel of Jesus Christ. I speak only for him. Nothing that I can say myself is of any worth if it does not come directly from the throne. Paul also says something that is interesting. He said, God set me apart to do this. God had predestined Paul to be a servant of God. Even though the first part of his life as a scholar and as a scribe and a Pharisee of the Pharisees, at a certain time in his life, God touches him. And that for which he was created becomes evident, but it wasn't when everybody expected it. If you had been one of the followers of the way in the first century and you heard of this zealous Pharisee, and Paul calls himself the Pharisee of the Pharisees, very zealous for the traditions of Israel, to the point that any of those who violated those traditions were anathema to him and to God. And his task then was to destroy those who would move past what they understood at the time. And God gets a hold of Paul on the road to Damascus. And the King of kings and Lord of lords and Jesus risen appears to him on his road to Damascus. And at that moment something happens to him as we remember what happens to his eyes? Scales form on them. In our lives, as we're continuing to live in this life, sometimes we call it the life of sorrows and griefs. Everyone experiences it. No one uh, can live a life without experiencing. Paul speaks to the church of Galatians and says that before I was even born, I was called, prepared to tell you the truth. Be wary of those who come and share a different gospel with you. He goes off into Arabia and then returns to Damascus. He stays there for three years. Paul is still learning. After three years, he goes to Jerusalem and he visits Peter and James, the brother of Jesus, and they begin to have conversations. Paul saying, I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Elijah was speaking for God in the the raising of that child, God was speaking through Elijah because Elijah was a prophet. God was speaking to Paul, a Pharisee and a Pharisee, set aside before he was created to become that Jew of all Jews. Experience that change of heart and mind at the appropriate and proper time that happens. Everything has a season and everything has a time. It makes no difference where you have come from 
or what your expectations of yourself are, as you live life, those things will appear differently <coughs> to you. One might say, God can't use me because I don't have any gifts and skills. We see here in these Gospels that those gifts and skills needed a time of preparation. And it may be later in your life that God calls you to a specific task, but you must have eyes to see and ears to hear to reckon and hear the voice of God at the appropriate time. Now we get to the gospel. Remember last week, the centurion slave who died, a Gentile, a centurion part of the Roman government, the oppressors of Israel, and Jesus heals the slave. Not by touching him or being over him three times like Elijah was with the child, but Jesus said the word and healing took place. Today in this gospel, very quickly, we find ourselves in the city outside of Capernaum. And in this area called Nain was, in fact, the place where Elisha worked his miracles. In this same territory, in that same dust and dirt, Jesus finds himself as he goes through from Capernaum to Nain. This was a very interesting community. They were called Stoics. You know what a Stoic person is? Theologically, stoic means that when I think about God, I think of him as being out there, but not totally non-emotional. God created the world. That's the way it is. He's out there. He doesn't really have any compassion for us down here. Jesus goes into Nain. He's not even into the city yet. And what he knows is the disciples are with him is that a dead young man in a wicker basket is being taken out led by a parade of professional mourners and singing and flutes, etc. This child has died. I want you to think about the lessons for today. With Elijah, what does the scripture say? It says that this child died, this male died, and she was a widow. So she had no one left to care for her. That woman in Israel at that time with no husband and no son was a persona non grata. As far as Israel is concerned, they had no care or concern for her, and most of the time, those widows without sons ended up living on the streets. Some of them had to go into prostitution just to eat. Some of them were too old and died on the streets. That was Elijah's time. Now we see once again, but something different. Elijah is praying to God and asking God and crying out to him to restore the life of this child. He does it three times because God is not acting the way he thinks he should. He continues to cry out to God, and on the third time, God heals the child. That's in Kings. That's Elijah. Today, here is the God incarnate, Jesus. Not just a man, but the fullness of God. The scripture says that he had deep. And if you look at the text in Greek, you will see that this is the most <coughs> in-depth understanding of compassion that there is. When he saw her and saw her weeping and her grieving, not only the death of her son, 
but she understood what was going to happen after this child is buried. She becomes a non-person. That was why when Jesus left uh, Nazareth to begin his ministry, then he made sure that the eldest brother had the responsibility for the blessed mother. The same is true here. Here's a woman coming, but unlike Elijah, he did not have to lay over the child three times and cry out to God for God to heal as Elijah did. All Jesus does is he walks up a heart of deep compassion and deep compassion touches that heart. Why? No crying out to God because God was saying, Rise. And the child goes. The dead man sat up, began to speak. And Jesus gave him again to his mother. He once was dead, now he is alive. In a sense, we might say theologically that he has risen. And because he has risen, he is a brand new person. Rather than as the Stoics say that God is up in heaven watching down on us, but not really caring and having no compassion, God sets the world into motion. Grief and pain and worry happens, but God is not caring. God is not available. God is not present with us. And on this day, in the midst of that stoic community, Jesus walks up to the bar and touches it. Child arrives. Now, what would you think if in all your entire life that you saw God as not having any compassion or really not even caring about what happens on this planet in our relationships with one another, in the midst of our grief and suffering? And all of a sudden, you witnessed with your own eyes the intense compassion of God through the Son and touched that in your life. Would that not change all of your thinking? God really is compassionate. God really does care about me. Sometimes we don't think God cares. Many times we will pray and nothing happens. But let me tell you something. When you pray, something happens. Always. And it may not be in the way in which you, you would like to have that prayer answered. But that prayer is going to be answered because God continually is walking the journey with us. Do not be afraid. Though I walk through the shadow of death, thou will be with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Think about this. Our world does not believe that God exists. And therefore, they will have to live in grief and sorrow and weeping without any hope sets us aside as Christians and as believers in God is that we believe that he will be present with us. Not only will he be present with us, we don't have to beg him to come because he is seeking us out now. We don't have to find God because God has already found us. We have to be willing to to be open and have our spirits open to him and see his presence and see when he is actually working and giving praise to God. We give praise to God. Sometimes I'm overwhelmed by the gospel. Today I'm overwhelmed. As I was doing the study and I'm almost through with my sermon. I did an exegesis on that section of scripture and I said when I read that get compassion on them for 
son was dead and she was a widow. And as I did that exegesis and I looked at the in-depth meaning of it, I was overwhelmed. I shed tears. Maybe for the first time, I really saw how much God cares for Rick. How much he loves me in spite of myself. And how close he is to my very soul. I don't have to beg him to come. He's already there. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. can be found on page 388, page 388. Let us pray for the whole, for the church and for the world. your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. We pray especially for Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Catherine, our presiding bishop, Michael William, the chief our bishop, Father Rick, our vicar, Beth, our regional priest and canon to the bishop, and Jane, our regional deacon. We also ask your prayers for Lord, in your mercy, God, the people of this land and of all the, the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. We pray especially for those in public positions of leadership, Barack, our president, Pat, our governor, and Paul, our mayor. Lord, in your mercy, give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly to the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, bless all whose lives are close to the links with ours. Grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. We pray especially for those serving our country, Charles, Harvey, Haynes, Jerry, Ronald, Will, Brad, Suzanne, and Jason. We also pray for our companion diocese, Costa Rica, and Botswana. And we pray 
especially for and thank you for the birthday of Jesus Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Give them hope in their uh, give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray especially for those for those who are homebound and not able to attend, Annie, Shirley, and Ed. We also pray for her that Nancy, Bill and Betty, Bryant, and Candace, Joe, Betty, Tara, Joe and Jean, Lena, Benjamin, Carol, share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, you have made us one with your saints in heaven and on earth. Grant that in our earthly pilgrimage, we may always be supported by this fellowship of love and prayer. Know ourselves to be surrounded by their witness to your power and sake of Jesus Christ, in whom all our intercessions are acceptable through the Spirit, and who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful. God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us stand and share the peace as we are accustomed.
God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Bless this shawl. May it bring forth and peace to those who pray. We offer this to you, Lord, and give you thanks. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We have a new family, our members here. Steve, Stephanie, and Eli. Stand up, y'all. <laughs> Stephen, we're so glad to have uh, Stephanie, your wife, here with us. And to, uh, we make you part of our family. And we send our love to you. And we receive your love back. Thank you. So give thanks this week for Laura's surgery on her arm. And she says she's doing well. So we're thrilled about that. Yes, you are. <laughs> and of course, you know, it's interesting that, you know, it's time I usually remember birthdays. And I want you to know that I did not forget Judith's <coughs> birthday today. But she won't let me do anything for her. She says that she has everything. I just want to uh, share with you, because probably I didn't communicate properly, but next Sunday will be Morning Prayer Rite 2, and it will be led by our two licensed uh, lay readers. Uh, Andy and Mike will be doing that with a prepared sermon, uh, while I will be in Atlanta with my, my son helping him move into his new home. This Saturday, uh, all the members of our vestry will be going to Duke Chapel uh, to be a part of the consecration of our new Suffolk Bishop. So I'm excited. I was thrilled that, that they sent us as many tickets as they did, because they said the tickets were limited. And lo and behold, the Lord gave us, what, six, six tickets. Uh, so Brad and Sally will be going, Haynes and Laura will be going, Belinda and Michael will be going, and... Uh, Karen Hay will be going. Judith, you have a question? Okay. Um, I think that's all that I had this morning. So. Again, good morning to everyone. And what a pretty morning this is. I welcome all the guests. We're especially pleased to have Stephen and his family here with us this morning. And I invite you all to come and have lemonade with us on the lawn. It looks like we're going to have a good day for it once again. The Lord has blessed us. Uh, I just wanted to remind you that the bishop, Bishop Curry, will be visiting us on June the 23rd. That's two weeks from today. And we would like to plan a reception for him. And I invite you all to, for that reception to bring a fig of food that we can share, and you can, while we're eating, we can visit with the bishop in the uh, parish house. Uh, and I think it'll be very nice to him that he will wants to meet with the vestry members, and after the, our meeting with him, the vestry will have its regular vestry meeting. So it's gonna be kind of a long afternoon for the vestry, so come prepared. Um, we are going to restart our prayer shawl ministry if any ladies knit or crochet and would like to join this ministry, all we ask is that you crochet a simple um, Afghan, lap rope, whatever you choose to do. Father Rick will bless it like he did this one this morning that Judy Newman made for us. And these will be distributed to people that are either in hospitals, stay at home, or in any, anyone that has a need for something warm and, and something with a lot of love from this congregation. You can contact Katie Cofield. Uh, she'll be glad to talk to you about it a little bit more. I want to remind you also, please don't forget Rowan Helping Ministries. 
Uh, it's our outgoing, it's been our outreach program for four and a half years and we don't want that, we don't want to lose that because it's a very important ministry for this church. And one last thing is a reminder that we will be having a yard sale in the fall. It's going to be our fall fundraiser. Uh, the ladies have chosen to call it the 50s at St. Paul's, and it should be a lot of fun. We're planning some things. So when you start cleaning out your closets and cupboards and garages and everything else, think about our fundraiser, okay? Thank you. John? I just want to take a moment to say thank you. Uh, last week I had asked if anyone would like to give a little extra to the organ fund in Thanksgiving for my anniversary of being with you, and it turns out last week we had about as much come in as we do in a half of a month <laughs> normally, so you, I, I'm very grateful for those offerings that were given in Thanksgiving. And the other good news is I get to recycle my e-sign. Anybody else have anything they'd like to say? Yeah. Uh, yes, our outreach program, the Dog Training, started when we had a full complement of 10 dogs. And our instructor, Tracy Cross, was so excited over the grounds that we had and the fact that we did all the registration and everything else. She left us with a $100 donation. That was great. Thank you. I have two right quick. Um, on behalf of St. Paul's family, Second thing, just keeping you up with some of our, well, actually two of our uh, athletic youth. If you haven't gone to a Legion game, you might need to go because Ryan's having a pretty good year. Um, he did well the other night. Uh, pitching, as a matter of fact, since our illustrious coach at Salisbury didn't think he could pitch, he had very little pitching time this year, but he has really made a mark uh, with the Legion team. I want to go see, but I'm working too late to do it. <laughs> anyway, uh, congratulations to Ryan. Keep it up. Thank you, Andy. Anybody else? Thank you all. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts. Let's pray. <laughs>
you, Lord God, of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer fruit of the vine and work of human hands that will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Amen. Pray, brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and the glory of his name. For our good and the good of all his church. Amen. The great thanksgiving continues on page 361 of the Book of Common Prayer. <coughs> the Lord be with you. Also you. Lift up your hearts. Yes, Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. To Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who ever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. <laughs> Gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. When we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this. For the remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant to shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Wherever you drink, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore we in the mystery of faith.
memorial of our, of our redemption, O Father, and the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. For all this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. For it is by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Savior Christ has taught us we're so bold that we sing together. <laughs>
receive, he told us. Come and receive these holy gifts.
let us offer a post-communion prayer to the Lord as we pray together on page 366. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, turn us out to the work that you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. God, which passes all understanding, may it keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and your families and friends this day and forever. <laughs>